um, happy Friday. I hope you guys are all having a good day. We've had a little bit of excitement this morning. Um, we started off, and my daughter's been going and um, meeting with a friend, and they've been doing a um, kind of just a run and a little exercise. And before we were able to, I was able to leave and take her. Our dog was let was let out in the backyard, and he we heard this yelping. And we go in the back, and he had tunneled underneath the fence and he's done this before but he usually he gets out you know the neighbors have a um a hole in their gate and so he'll he's able to get out through that and out onto the street well i guess there was somebody in the backyard and he was yelping so i don't know if they threw something at him or hit him or what but he we had to go and chase him down through the neighborhood so after I'm done here, that's going to be our project for the day is to go and figure out how to block that hole. It's He started it when we had a lot of rain and the ground was wet and so he tunneled underneath it. And so then we, I filled it with, tried filling it up with dirt again. He tunneled out. He, I tried putting bricks and, you know, big heavy things in there. No, he can move it. And then his dog friend on the other side will help him like get those those bricks out of the way so we're gonna have to come up with a solution for keeping this dog in the backyard because this is just not gonna be able to continue going on so anyway um, thanks for joining me today uh, and just to do a recap I'm Carla with race to walk org and the past few weeks I've just been doing a little reflection on um, a passage in the Bible I've been as I've mentioned I've been doing a a Bible study that's my whole church is doing. It's a one-year chronological Bible, and this is my copy right here. But if you are interested in following along with us, you can actually do it even without any any physical Bible at all. They do have the reading plan on U Version, the Bible app, and uh, you can go to One Year Chronological Bible. And then every day it has a set reading. So if you started in January, you would read through the whole Bible in a year. I do have a post on my website, Race to Walk, if you want to get the instructions on how to follow this. But um, basically, just again to recap, the chronological Bible is different in that it doesn't go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, how the books in the in the the Bible are ordered. It will go Genesis, Exodus. Actually, it doesn't even go Genesis, Exodus. It goes Genesis, Job, and then Exodus because it goes by the time, the things that are occurring. So right now in um, today's what, June 29th, uh, we're in the time of the divided kingdom in Israel. And so there's a lot of bouncing back and forth in the passages. So we'll, this this week we've been reading in uh, Second Kings, Second Chronicles, there was some um, passages in Amos, which I thought about talking about today because I love Amos, but and then but also Isaiah and Hosea. So it's kind of going all over, but it's really interesting when you read it this way because you can see, like sometimes we'll read the prophets, but we don't, we're not really getting the context of what they were speaking to. Today I'm going to be talking about Hosea. And he was a uh, prophet during the time of, actually several kings. Let me go back and look. I have it here. It says he was a king in, I'm sorry. Let's see. I got to where I was going to go and I should have gone back. Uh, he was a king during the time of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And also in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. So they, um, he was speaking to them. And as I was reading through some of the some of the prophecies that he gave, um, just to to explain who Hosea was, he was a prophet. He is the one who God told to marry a prostitute, and this was a a symbol to Israel, Israel that. This is basically who you are. You have prostituted yourself with other gods at the time. Israel was going to um, other nations and making alliances with them, placing their dependence on these these foreign treaties with the pagan nations versus trusting in God to protect them. And so this is this is what he's saying. The people um, had been 
kind of mixing their worship, but they still were worshiping God. So it wasn't that they were had totally turned away from him, but they were comfortable in what they were doing, and they weren't really seeking him truly. And so one of the things that... Um, I actually have a, a post that I'm going to, an article that I wrote that I haven't posted yet. It's probably going to be coming up later today. I still have to do the post. I still have to do some of the graphics on it. But it's actually on, uh, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, it's that my people perish for lack of knowledge. It's it's on that. So I um, I talk a little bit about how the common interpretation, the sentiment may be true, but that's not, it's actually a misinterpretation of that particular passage. So anyway, um, there, this is just a little, this is one of the things that we go over in my Sunday school class with my, our eight year olds, but Hosea was, is considered a minor prophet. So it's not that his prophecy wasn't as important. It's just that in terms of the books of the Bible, they are shorter than the major prophets, which are, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So they have, they are still important they're just not as they're just not as long so if you want to say hey i read through a book of the bible today you can go to one of those those minor prophets starting with hosea and some of them are only a few chapters long so anyway um there was there was so much in this i've read through the bible i don't know how many times but i've never really focused on the book of isaiah and there were just so many things that stood out to me once i was reading through it this week so Anyway, um, one of the things, this isn't the, actually what I wanted to talk about, but this is, I just wanted to mention this because I thought it was interesting. One of the things in uh, Hosea 2 verse 16, he is saying, so Hosea has prophesied a, um, that, they're, that, that Israel is going to be basically banished from the land. He's, he's prophesying the exile that's going to be coming is this coming down the line and but then he does um, promise restoration after that and that is in Hosea chapter 2 so it begins as therefore behold I will allure her I br will bring comfort or bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her I will give her vineyards from there in the valley of acre as the door of hope she shall sing there as in the days of her youth as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt and it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband that, and that you will no longer call me my master. And if you read through this further, I, I go over this more in the article that's going to be coming online in a little bit. It's not, if you know the history of Israel, there's a series of, of exiles. So shortly after the time of Hosea, Israel is taken into captivity and then Judah is and only a remnant come back so a lot of the the people of Israel were dispersed and they didn't return so they were in their kingdom for a while they were always after that they were always under this um, subjugation of foreign rule they, uh, there was only a, a short period of time during the time of the Maccabees where they had their own actually their own kingdom their own rule and then after after that, you know, it was the, the, they had the Greeks, they revolted against the Greeks, the Romans came in and captured them, and that is when Jesus was born. He was born during the time when Israel was a province, it was known as a province of Judea, um, and then shortly, not too long after he, he was born, they were taken as like an actual part of the, of the Roman Empire, um, and in about a hundred years after he, he was he died so during this time the Jews have been revolting against the Roman the Romans they want their own um, their own rule and then in I think it was like one I didn't look this up ahead of time 135 136 right around there there was a uh, claimant claiming to be the the Messiah and Bar Kokhba and he revolted against the Romans, and after that, they completely annihilated and wiped out the Jews. Not completely, but they they totally conquered the Jews. They banned them from coming into Jerusalem, and they renamed Judea to uh, Palestine so that they were trying to completely wipe out any mention of the Jewish people 
in the land. And so for almost 2,000 years, the Jewish people didn't have their own land until 1948 when Israel was created a nation. So they returned to the land. If you've seen any pictures of it, they're just doing such amazing things as far as, as far as, um, inventions and, you know, reclamation of the land and restoring, um, the, restoring the fruitfulness of the land. Because if you've ever read Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad, in the 1800s, it was just like a wasteland. And that's what he said. He's like, you know, this is a promised land, you know, like who, who would want it basically, but it's completely different now. It's like this little oasis in the middle of this barren land. So he's, they're promising a, a time of restoration, a time of fruitfulness and abundance. And it would seem like, Hey, maybe is that this time right now? But listen to this. It's not, it also promises a time of peace. And we know that definitely know that that has not come yet to Israel. They are the most, um, probably the most attacked country in the world. They're constant, you know, every so often, you know, every, Every few months recently, actually, as I follow some of their uh, accounts on on Twitter, and they'll have their under rocket attacks, so they'll have be under basically a shower of of um, attacks by uh, rockets launched from one of the neighboring countries. So you know that time has not come because it's not it's, they don't have peace, right? But the other part of it that we know that has not come yet is that this verse right here, it's verse 16, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. So if you're not familiar with this, um, in modern Judaism, people do not say, like, oh, the, uh, the divine name of God, Yahweh, which is uh, yod He vav He, which means I am, they don't say that. They don't say the word at all. So there's actually a, a site called, I think it's Memory Mamre, which is has the Bible in Hebrew. And also you can listen to the audio version of the Bible or read the passage in Hebrew. And so, so I have a reader's Bible that has the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek. And so sometimes if I want to, I know a little bit of Hebrew, but sometimes if I want to practice my Hebrew, I'll go and find a, um, a passage in the Bible, and then I'll go to that website, and I'll listen to um, their the a rabbi reading the scripture, so I can hear the words, see the words, and try to, you know, work on learning the vocabulary a, a little more. So what I normally do is I go through, and in the passage, I'll highlight where it says Yahweh, because what they will say is, instead of Yahweh, they will say Adonai, rather than Yahweh. And so then that's kind of my little marker in the text because sometimes I'll get a little bit lost in it and I don't know where I'm at, but I'll, that will help me, you know, keep track of with what they're saying. So Adonai does not, what, you know what it means? It means master. That's the word they use in place of, of Yahweh. So what he's saying is, you will no longer call me master. You will call me my husband, which is a completely different relationship, isn't it? And that that is not that is not where they're at right now. And it was interesting because yesterday I was um, I'm not on Twitter a whole lot, but I was just kind of I'll just scan through you know my feed and see if there's anything and reply if um, somebody has commented on something that I've posted. And I came across this post by a. Uh, what looked like it was a Jewish site, and I can't remember, I should have went back and looked this up, I should have um, remembered what the verse was, but it was, you, oh, it was Deuteronomy 11, I think 12, but it says, and it was talking about the land of Israel, that God, that at its, um, it's a land blessed by Adonai, this is what they use, and this is, they just use that had one of those quote graphics and they put Adonai in the text. Well, if you go back and look in the um, scripture, and again, it will say the Lord. So this isn't always true in modern translations, but you can tell this in 
um, the King James Version especially, I'd have to go look and see what other translations do this, but if you see LORD in all caps, what that means is uh, that that is that is Yahweh. That is the translation for Yahweh. So it's Yod Heh Vav Heh. This is that's how they translate it, and that that's the word that it used. Another way you can see what the words are is if you go to. I have to remember. I I can't can't remember what the name of the app is. It's a King James Bible, but it has Strong's with it. It's a red. Icon. It used to be a little different in the updated. I don't really like the new update of the app as much. But it will have, it's a little red um, icon for the Bible. And it also has strong. So if you're in the King James Version, and you, it will have a little icon below. And it says, it has an S for strongs. If you click on that, it will give you the, um, by each of the words for Hebrew, it will give you the Strong's number, and you can click on that and see um, what the original word in the Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek was in the Bible, which is really interesting. So it's it's helpful sometimes when you're doing a study, and if you really want to know what a word means, to look at what not only the word that's used, but how it's used in other contexts. So. Anyway, he's Hosea is prophesying, you will not call me my master. And I had shared that on, uh, because I shared that on my Twitter feed. And um, someone had replied and they said, yeah, it's, they use, how they refer to God, they use it, uh, textual scholars use that to date the text itself. So I'm not quite sure, I have to do a little bit more research on this, I'm not quite sure if at the time of Hosea they were already starting to not use the word Yahweh. I kind of think not because he was not the last prophet to write and people used the word Yahweh in their writing a lot, you know, much later than that. And also the Chronicles, the Chronicle um, it was actually written later. So they were still using, at that time, they were still using the word Yahweh to refer to God to write in the text. Obviously, if they're writing in the text, it was being read to other people, so they were reading it, they were saying it, so there was no, nothing against um, using God's, you know, using that name. But Hosea prophesies in in his one of his first prophecies that we have written that they will be calling God Master. So not only do they they not even refer to his name, but they call his name. They, they've been calling him master. So this prophecy is not even, it's not even like, it hadn't even happened. So not as he only prophesying the restoration, but he is prophesying really that, that division that will be coming. Because at the time of Jesus, you know, they had, they weren't using God's name, um, Yahweh, they were, and at, during the time of the Septuagint, when they transferred the, or translated the Old Testament to the New Testament, or to, not to the New Testament, but to Greek, they translated Yahweh as Kiros, which means Lord. So I'm not sure if that was because there was no equivalent to uh, Yahweh in Greek, or if they had just, um, if they had had already started down that path of not speaking God's name because if you if you know any Jewish people what they will do is they they, they won't say Yahweh like I said they use um, they will replace the word Adonai anytime it says Yahweh in the text they also don't if they're more orthodox they will also they won't even write the word God or Lord when they're referring to God they will put a dash in where the vowel is and so the the argument for that is that they don't want to take God's name in vain, and so they're afraid if they don't pronounce it right, that they won't be, you know, this will be violating the second commandment, which that's not what it is. You know, what it is is when God says, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, 
we are God's representatives. If we're supposed to be God's, we are God's people and we are supposed to representing him with integrity. We are supposed to be a reflection of his nature and his character. So we are supposed to have mercy and compassion. We're supposed to act rightly and with integrity. And when we don't do that, that, that is taking God's name in vain. It's not about enunciation. It's about how we act and how we behave. And Hosea talks about this. He said, I don't desire sacrifices. I desire... Um, yeah, so I, this is in Hosea 4 and verse 16 of oh, 14. I will not punish. So it says, for the men themselves, they offer sacrifices with ritual har harlots. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. So it says you've, they've rejected knowledge. They've rejected God's, God's righteousness. And that's the issue, not about whether or not, um, how you pronounce his name. And one of the things that kind of bothers me, I, I wasn't really, uh, couldn't remember like what this particular account was for on Twitter that I followed that was posting that verse with Adonai replaced for Yahweh. So I went and I looked and it was actually a messianic account. Now, if you're not familiar with this, I like a lot of people don't really, uh, if you're not familiar with people who are in messianic Judaism or, um, in kind of this Hebrew roots culture, you may not be familiar with, with what it is, but like most of us think of a messianic Jew as a Jewish person, an ethically Jewish person who be believes in Jesus. So that's what we think of as messianic Judaism. That's not actually what it is. So you can go to Messianic Jewish congregations and have people who say they're Messianic Jews who are not Jewish at all. So this particular account that was posting that that verse, um, they're Messianic Jews. And the thing that bothers me about this is that I understand that for Jewish people, this is a cultural thing. If you replace Yahweh with Adonai, if you put dashes in, in, you know, the words, I understand that that's cultural. That's, that's what they do. That's what they've been taught to believe. But for believers, for Christians, what bothers me about that is that we're saying that we know the Lord, that we are in communion and fellowship with him. We should understand that we should know that we know God's name and that we can have, we can have that fellowship with him. And so when you're, it just seems like such a um, legalistic th thing to do. It just, it really bothers me when Christians do that, especially when they're not Jewish. Uh, they're not actually Jewish. I mean, maybe they just think that they're ministering to Jewish people and they don't want to be offensive to them. And if that's the case, I understand if they really believe that they're being more righteous by leaving out bowels, then that's kind of an issue for me. So anyway, um, to kind of go back to what I was have been talking about for the past few weeks. So for three weeks ago, I talked about Jehoshaphat, who was a king of Judah and a righteous king, but he had some bad associations that led him astray a little bit. Last week, I talked about Athaliah, who was the wife of Jehoshaphat's son who caused all sorts of problems for Judah. She actually uh, killed all the claimants to the throne when her husband was killed or when he died. And so that wrong association of Jehoshaphat's had long lasting impact. So this week, the what really stood out to me was that Hosea talks about um, let me go, I'm kind of flipping back and forth, so, okay, here it is. So, what Hosea says is the problem with Israel is that the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray. They have played the harlot against their God. They offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, and terebinths because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit adultery. So, what what Hosea is saying here is that there's a couple of things. Um, the, the one thing that stood out to me is that, I mentioned this before, that 
if you go back and through all these um, these indictments against the people of Israel and Judah, the prophets, the chronicler will say they still offered on the high places, and so it could have been maybe that they were worshiping pagans, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It just meant that they were offering sacrifices in a place and and in a way that God had told had not. Authorized. They were supposed to go down to Jerusalem to make their sacrifices. They were also supposed to, all of them together at the same time, were supposed to twice a year, they were to go down to Jerusalem for the feast. So in the spring and in the fall. So before the harvest and then after. And what struck me about this is it said, but their tree was pleasant, so they stayed there. It's not, part of it is, yes, you are being obedient to God and doing what he you know, worshiping him in the way that he, he said. But also the other thing that this did is that it brought the whole community together. It was a time of fellowship. And so those that were just worshiping on their own tree in their own way were not with the body of believers, right? So they were in their own little spot rather than coming together as a group. And that echoes what Paul says, do not forsake the gathering together of believers as some people do. So how many people do you know that do that? I know a lot. They get offended. They don't like people that, you know, something in the church makes them mad. And so they're like, I, you know, I'm just going to, it's just me and Jesus. We're just going to, you know, I'm just going to worship in my own way. That is exactly, exactly what Israel and Judah were doing. They were offering sacrifices under their own tree because it was pleasant and easy, and it was just them and God. And they got way, way, way off track pretty darn fast when it was just by themselves. And so that's part of the reason that we're supposed to have body believers that um, we're in fellowship with. And there's a number of reasons this. There's power and agreement. There is... um, you just for support and fellowship, like when you're going through a hard time, you need believers around you that can help you through that. But also so that we're accountable to other people. We need people that will be, you know, giving us a word of correction if when we get off. We need people who care about us enough to tell us what we need to hear rather than what's comfortable for us. And so, and also the other thing is we can't be isolated. You know, we're, our culture is so, so divisive. And part of it is is because we don't have, we we're, have this, this, this solo attitude that we can just do it all on our own. And that's just not, I mean, it doesn't work for a country and it definitely does not work for the Christian faith. It's, you, you can't be on a solo effort. You need to be around people who will care about you and support you and, and help you grow. God it's not just um, God gave us other believers and, and, and family for a reason, and so we need to take advantage of that. So the other thing, too, is that um, I've been, like, if you go to my website, I have a lot of articles about discerning of spirits and um, not as much about spiritual warfare, but I do have a few articles about that. And a lot of times there is a spirit, like if you're coming into a situation, there's a spirit operating in that situation you can have all this effort going on and you're not getting anywhere. The spirit needs to be identified. And so you rebuke that spirit. And once that's handled, then then the release can come. And then, then the problems can be taken care of. So they had, if you look at um, Isaiah and some of the other prophets and reading through the passages with the kings, they talk a lot about some of the idolatry, like people were mixing their worship, but what Hosea says, he pinpoints what the issue is. He says it is a spirit of harlotry. And if you're interested in how these, like how situations with, um, kind of work in clusters, like these spirits kind of work together, there's a book, um, called Strongman, uh, what is his name? I think it's like Strongman, what is his name? I don't remember what it is. I don't actually have the physical copy. I just have it on a Kindle. But it gives the clusters of how um, how those different spirits work. And so there's a, what to do is you identify the spirit that's operating, the strong man, right? 
and in this case it's the strong man is the spirit of, of harlotry you anything in your life in you personally in your life you repent of that you plead the blood of jesus over it you put it at the foot of the cross and say lord i, I repent of this um you know please fill me with your spirit and you pray the opposite so this instead of the spirit of harlotry would be you know a spirit of purity and also the fear of the lord that we have to fear god and follow in him and so that is um I just feel like I need to say this. If you have anything in your life that you just feel like you've worked and worked and worked and worked and you have, you've repented of it, you've, you've done all you can do, you've read the Bible, you've, you've tried and you just can't, you just can't get victory over it and you just think that that's just the way it's going to be, there's, it's not just, um, I've seen this so many times like in a prayer ministry I was in, it's not just you it can also be generational so if there's something in your family line that um, was a failing then that needs to be repented of as well and your whole bloodline cleansed so here in the case of Hosea it wasn't just those individual people there was a whole line you know generation after generation who had followed in this way. And I remember when uh, Ross Pro was running way back when, and he, this is before YouTube, so he was spent millions of dollars of his own money on educating the American people about how, what a big deal our national debt was. And so he explained to us the difference between a, the debt and the, defi or, and the deficit. So what we spend in a year, if we spend more than we make, that's our deficit for the year. But our debt is everything that's accumulated, all those years of deficits, those, our debt is the total of it. And so in terms of Israel and nations and um, when the prophets come, they're saying, these are the things that you've done wrong, you need to repent, you need to repent. Some did, some didn't. So if you look at the life of Hosea, he prophesied to several different kings. Ahaz was kind of iffy, but Hezekiah, was the, who was Ahaz's son, was a righteous king. And so, was it because of Hosea's words? I mean, it might have been. We don't, we don't know. Maybe Hezekiah was listening to Hosea and the other prophets and repented. And repented of the wrong things. And so that judgment was pushed back of for all the, the the wrong things that we had done because it's talking about, uh, Hosea talks about the iniquity of the nation. So our sin, you know, is an individual. But when those sins pile up and they're not repented of and they're not put under the blood. So in the Old Testament, they had blood atonement. They had, you know, they sacrificed animals to cleanse the land and themselves of that sin. It covered it, it didn't remove it, but it covered it and it kept the judgment from coming. But there were certain sins that couldn't, e that couldn't be um, atoned for with animal sacrifice and those were the ones, like some people say, well why is the consequence for certain actions different under the new covenant and the old covenant does it mean that God doesn't care about those things anymore? No, that's not what it means. But what it means is that under the old covenant, those things, there was no remedy for them other than for the person to be put to death. There was, it would have an impact on the land. It had an impact of over the people. And so what Hosea is saying here is that your accumulated sin, this iniquity, is so great that judgment is coming. So this is still, I, this is something some people get a, little ups, get a little uncomfortable with. God hasn't changed. The laws that God put into place did not change at the cross. What changed is we have a remedy for it. So whatever the situation is, whatever it is, there's a remedy. There's there's forgiveness. You can be we can be cleansed of it, but we have to repent of it and we have to plead the blood of Jesus over over that situation. So I personally um, I'm adopted, so I don't know what my generational line is. I don't know the things that they've done, but I've had um, there have been times when. Um, 
God will kind of highlight an issue to me and I'll research it and I'll recognize kind of the wrongness of an action. And I've come to realize that that's an opportunity for me to repent of that sin and to um, plead a, a, a generational um, a generational repentance over over my bloodline because I you know I don't have firsthand knowledge of what my family history is. But the other thing I'll say is that even if you are you know with your family of origin, you don't necessarily know all the stuff in their background. I mean, people don't don't usually share their you know the skeletons in their closet they'll talk about the good things but they won't say yeah well you know so and so was a drunk and he cheated this person this person this person out of you know in in this contract or this person was a um yeah they, they, we're not going to tell you that so if you if there's an area in your life that you you have sincerely been seeking after um, God to like help you get victory over, then just say, you know what, God, I know that you are a good God and Jesus died on the cross so that I can be free from every single yoke. And I'm claiming that in the name of Jesus. So please reveal to me any, any sin that, that needs to be addressed in my blood, in my bloodline. And so be open and aware to that. I've had dreams sometimes where I felt like, okay, this is kind of weird. It was like, I was watching something occur, which I'm, you know, looking back, I really think that that was about something, you know, that one of my ancestors had done that needed to be prayed about. I had another dream where I was going with, um, it was not my actual brother, but in my dream, the person was my brother. And so we were going along to a destination and we came to this cliff and I was trying to go up and over this cliff and my brother got up and was running on ahead of me but I dropped down and I went, when I you know got down to the ground it was actually a crypt and I could see all this kind of people had that somebody had been rooting through this crypt and I knew that it was my um my grandmother and I so what that is, is, is actually, I think that was God telling me, you know, there are some things here that they're, that the enemy is, is, is researching to get, to get a claim on you because Satan can't attack you without an open door. So sometimes this is an open door in your own life. So we have to watch our words, we have to watch our actions, we we are responsible for our thoughts. But as I've been talking about in the in the past couple weeks, sometimes those things are um, through our associations with other people that that can be an access, and then other times it can be um, in your family line, and so. I think that sometimes um, we don't really talk about that in the church. I've talked to a lot of people and they're like, well, you know, I'm saved and, you know, I'm free, you know, we're, and we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about, you know, if you are, um, if you never address this issue and you die, you're going to be going to heaven. It's not about salvation. What we're talking about is freedom today where you can walk in peace and abundance and not always going up against opposition because things are constantly coming against you and you feel like you're, you know, you're under the rock rather than on top of it. So, you know, that's one of the promises for those who follow God is that we're to be the head, not the tail, right? So if you're not, if we're not in that position, then we need to look at what are the reasons. And, and that is one reason. I, and that's one that I don't think that we, at least in, I mean, there may be some, some denominations that talk about it more than others, but the denominations that I've been in really don't at all. This didn't come up. I didn't even learn about this until real recently. One of the, um, one of the people who teaches on this a lot, if you've ever, um, seen, read any books by Robert Henderson and, um, he has a book called the courts of heaven. He has, there's, he has a lot of YouTube videos out there too. And one of the, the last one I, that I watched of him, he said, um, it was kind of a Q and a, and somebody said, well, what about people who are adopted? And he said, 
well you need to handle you need to address both of them because you have you have someone coming in you, you have your bloodline you know that you your DNA but you also have these things that are they're affecting you in your adoptive bloodline by covenant so both of them need to be addressed the thing is sometimes we don't know what the cause is so if there's something that's just weird then sometimes that means that there's a spirit operating in that situation and so if that sounds like odd then this is I'm going to tell you my um, one final story and then I'll wrap it up if you have any prayer requests I mean just hey put it out there and we can pray before I go but when I started volunteering for this prayer ministry the people that were in it they were all you know very very charismatic and I've been you know, I've, I've always believed in the gifts of the Spirit, but I haven't always expected them. And so, I've historic, like most of my life, I was in a, um, I was in churches that taught the Word of God, but they didn't expect the fruition of it so much. So, this was a little bit different situation for me going into this because it was most of the, the people who came for prayer were coming for prayer for healing. And not only were they coming for healing, but they we were praying and expecting to see an answer. And so we went through a whole training. Uh, we read a book by um, Charles and Francis Hunter, if you're interested in this. It's called uh, How to Heal the Sick. They actually lived in the same same community that I lived in. They, they both passed away now. But I always thought that was a cool connection and a couple of other ones and we would go through this whole training and practice praying for each other and so we saw people you know healed and set free in just in the training while we were going through it and so it was really exciting so the first time the very first time i uh was actually volunteering it was right after the training had had ended and we the way that they would set it up they would when someone would come they would have a little sheet and you would the person would fill out you know what the issue was they would also fill out um you know what their their faith belief was because it was open to anybody to come but obviously they wouldn't ask for somebody you know offer communion to someone who wasn't a christian and they would kind of approach it a little bit differently so they wanted to know if someone was a believer versus if they weren't so then they would go to, they would come up one by one, they would go into this room and people would just, there would be music playing and people would just pray for them silently. And then after that they would go into a, a room with a person who would talk with them and kind of get a little bit more feedback and then pray specifically for them. So it was kind of a two-step process. And I was in the room where we were just praying silently so I was really relieved because there's no pressure nobody was going to be hearing how I prayed or anything. And so this lady came in who had been, uh, had, that had gone through the training with us because we had several people that came because, you know, we're all excited about it and ready to start. And so she had problems with her shoulder and she was sitting there and I was just praying for her silently and she kind of turned around and she said, oh, I just, when you were praying, I felt like I should move my arm. She said, I just want to say that to encourage you. So I was like, oh, awesome. This is great. This works. So then this other lady came in, and this is from the outside, and she had all I knew was her first name, and then they wrote down what the problem was, and it was head and neck pain, which seemed kind of similar to what this lady, uh, this other lady that I had just prayed for was. So I thought, okay. So when I, the people that were in this group, um, they were very, I mean, they operated, massively operated in the gifts of the Spirit. I mean, there are people who get words and knowledge like that. I mean, they would totally read your mail, see visions. I mean, it was just really, I kind of felt like the little, you know, the, the special one in the corner because I, you know, for me, when I would, when I would pray for someone, I would just get verses for them. And so whatever verse come to my mind, I would just pray that over the person. And so the verse that came to my mind when I was praying for her was that God was a shield and a shelter to, you know, those who followed him. And I was praying for the lady and she kind of took a breath and, and exhaled and didn't say anything. And so then I moved on to the next person that came in 
and this was another person that had gone through the training, so I knew who he was. And uh, I, I was praying for him, and he said, I feel something. And I was like, great, awesome, you know, because I'm thinking of the first person, you know, that I prayed, and he's, something's changing, and that's, that's a good thing. And so I finished that, and I had written a few notes, and I took them out to the, the main person that was directing people around and, and to give it to them. And, and the, the last man that I prayed for came out, and he said, what were you praying? And I said, well, I said so the verse that was coming to my mind was perfect love casts out fear. And so that's what I was praying for you, that you know God would just, everything that wasn't of God, was just you know the love of God would fill you, and, and that there would be nothing else that was, you know, affecting you. And he said, well, because he didn't have pain. He did not come in for pain. He came in for like some sort of bug or virus or something that didn't, uh, just couldn't get rid of. And so I, he said, well, when you started praying, I had this, this pain in my back. And as soon as you started praying, stop praying, it stopped. And the first thing that went through my head, I was like, I hope that didn't happen to that lady. I mean, I just, it was a little shocking to me that like praying actually, I, I know this sounds silly because I've been a Christian since I was seven, but it was just like one of those, oh my goodness, like praying for somebody makes things happen. And so, um, I, it, it, it worried me a little, a little bit. And so what we had learned in our training is that if you pray for somebody and the pain moves or gets more intense when you pray for them, that's a sign of a, um, like an unclean spirit or something affecting that particular situation. So I don't think that, um, I, if you've ever read anything by Derek Prince, he talks about how possession is a very bad, um, translation and understanding of that word. You know, the, you know, we, Paul said, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. And so there is this unseen world that, you know, that's under the, the authority of Satan who hates us and will do everything to, he can to destroy us. And so if there's a, um, if you have something that's uh, an issue, I don't think that, that, that demons or unclean spirits can cause a problem for you, but I think they can make a problem worse. And so whatever it was that he was dealing with, it wasn't a pain, but the, if it doesn't heal, we're meant to heal. God made our bodies to heal, to heal themselves. So if it does not heal, sometimes a block can be a demonic in, interference. And so it needs to be identified, prayed against, and then pray for healing again. So to go back to this lady, she went into went in for prayer, and we had a little recap afterwards. They don't they never use any names. The only reason I knew who this person was was because I had I had prayed for. Her. So they had uh, she had gone in for prayer. The person that was leading the prayer or leading the little session was um, a pastor, and when she came, she had um, she had severe head and neck pain, like between, a, a, on a pain level between 7 and 10 for, I think it was like 15 months, a long time. She had been to so many different doctors, nobody could help her, and it got to a point where she said, God, you just got to take me or heal me, because I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. And so they were praying, and they were trying to you know, get a sense of it. They weren't getting any sort of vibe or lead, they, no sense of what was going on. And the pastor said the only thing that, that came to his mind was the woman with the issue of blood who reached out her hand and grabbed Jesus' robe and was healed through faith. And he said, well, why don't you, why don't you reach out your hand as an act of faith and act, ask God for healing? And so she did that, and the pain level went down, I think it was to a five, which doesn't sound like super exciting, but she was encouraged by it because that has been the lowest level of pain for the entire, all this time. And so she was on my, it was one of those things that um, really had an impact on me, and I was praying for her the, the whole next week, and I had this dream 
uh, and it was of a, um, it was in the upstairs of, I can't remember if we were still living in the house. I think it was uh, the house that we had lived in before. And there was this, I, I knew it was a demon, but it looked like, you know, from, um, one of the Star Wars movies, the Sith Lord, where he had like the red face with the black tattoos on it. It looked like that. And he would look down at a, um, at a computer and look up and the, the tattoos would shift on his face and he would say tricky dicky and he'd look down and look up and that kept going. And I, I don't know, I had just at that time just started learning about dream interpretation. I don't know what it, I don't even think I was writing down my dreams at that point. And I don't know what that meant, but I knew it had something to do with that lady. And so that that same day, we got an email. I wasn't volunteering at the prayer ministry, but I got an email from with an update of what had happened that next week. And again, they don't use any names. They were just kind of giving a recap of what had happened. And the same lady came back, and she was, you know, went for prayer. It was a different a different team that was praying for. Her. And this particular team had experience in deliverance, and um, she went in, and I, I don't know the whole story. I just was reading the recap in, in the email that went out, but they somehow they figured out that there was some sort of demonic interference that was going on, and they were trying to cast it out, and the pain level was going through the roof, and they said, asked the lady, what do you, you know, what, what are you experiencing right now? What's going on? She said, I see a black faced demon clawing at me and trying to get me. And that totally freaked me out. I was like, wow. You know, so this was after that, it was like, I felt like God was saying, you need to get, this is something you need to get up to speed on because, you know, theoretically I had always, you know, I read the Bible. I, when it talks about demons and unclean spirits, I believe that, but to have that actual, to have witnessed something of an impact of that, that these unclean spirits or demons or whatever these entities are can actually not only influence like, you know, influence, but have an impact on our health and our life, that freaked me out. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I need to, I, so I started reading for about a year and a half. That's all I read. I read books on deliverance and spiritual warfare. And, um, if you want to read about that, you can read, uh, Derek Prince, highly recommend him. He has thou shall cast out demons. He is, he's a solid teacher. And he was the one that, um, taught me that if there is a if there's something spiritual that's interacting in that situation, praying for healing is almost a waste of time. You need to deal with that first. You know, put it under the blood of Jesus, you know, and then you can pray for healing. But you're not going to see an improvement until then. And I didn't learn that in the, in the prayer ministry that I was in because they were all like, we don't do deliverance, 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 we don't do deliverance. We don't do deliverance didn't deal with it at all. The, the couple who was, um, you know, that, that, that lady had gone to, I mean, they were just kind of going with the, going with where the spirit led, but it wasn't because it was part of what that ministry did is they had prior experience with it. So we did see people healed. I mean, it was a, such a fun thing, you know, to go and to see like, I, I always felt like, okay, God, what's God going to do today? It was so exciting to just like go and be around people who, who not only would pray for healing, but were expecting it to happen. And the people who came were coming expecting. So you had this whole atmosphere of expectancy and there was an opening for God to work because sometimes this is one thing that I've noticed that the longer you've been a Christian and the more churched you are, sometimes the more you are against God actually moving in your life. I mean, that's just the truth. I mean, go talk to somebody about, about stuff like that. And you're going to see this kind of, this wall go up, you know, and it's going to make a lot of people really uncomfortable. But anyway, um, we did see it, but I don't, I think we would have seen 
more if we had looked at the whole picture, which in this ministry we weren't. We just looked at the symptom, this end result, versus not looking at, looking for, is there anything behind this that we need to handle first? And going back to the lady that had that rare form, rare form of cancer, I am absolutely convinced that there was something, it was just so obvious, it was, it, there was something generational that was affecting her. So, anyway, it's kind of a long, um, roundabout, um, co comment, but going back to Hosea, what it says is that they don't, you know, people are going to be affected and they're going to have these negative impacts and they're not going to know why. They're not going to know, number one, because they weren't taught any better. And number two, they don't, they don't know the bondage that they're putting themselves under by their actions. And so they don't even see it. So this there I'm just gonna wrap it up with like God God loves you, He has a plan for you. In John ten ten says this thief does not come except to seek, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So if there is any error in your life that you're not feeling that you have that abundance or peace about, you know what? That's not that's not God's will for your life. He came that you might have peace, right? That you can have peace in all the circum in every circumstance. So it doesn't mean that your life is going to be, um, you know, a cakewalk. We can still go through some of those hard times, but it means that even in those times, that you can have a peace and a confidence that that God is with you. So anyway, so that's enough for today. Again, um, I've been doing a cause some people, a few people came on while I was in the middle of this, but I've been doing a, uh, this is from the One Year Chronological Bible, and you can go on new version if you want to jump in and start in on this session. It has daily passages that you can go through. They also have the whole reading plan on, um, this is actually the, the version that my church did, the One Year Chronological Bible book from Tyndale, but Tyndale also has a couple of different editions on Amazon that you can get. So, that's enough for today. I have to go and figure out how to keep our dog in our backyard. So um, I hope you guys all have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and a great new week next week, um, especially going into the fourth. I hope everybody has a safe holiday and also a peaceful one. So anyway, I, that's, I'll be seeing it next week. Thanks.